Good morning. What is going on, my YouTube family? It's about 7 a.m. right now. Good old California. Nice and nice and breezy right now. A little bit foggy, but nice and cool. I don't even know why I'm up here doing a video. It cost me a lot of money and time just to go ahead and create these videos, but I feel it's helping people. Uh, I guess like there's a lot of people that's actually listening to what I'm saying, you know. And uh, all I can say is my expertise is being a 50 year old growing up as a Cambodian American. And that's all I know. I don't know about Vietnamese life. I don't know about the Thai life. I don't know about black people's lives. You know, I can't speak on them. So the only thing I can speak on is my life as pretty much a Khmer American. And like I said before, we always gonna go ahead and go straight to the subject and hit that sensitive topic that people don't want to talk about they don't like it because sometimes the truth hurts whatever the deal is um, you know I want to go ahead and clarify and talk about it because I don't have nothing to gain you know I'm, I'm 50 years old I'm not looking for fame I'm not looking for fortune uh, trying to make a name trying to make trouble I just want to say what it is okay so the topic I want to go ahead and discuss today is going to be very sensitive to a lot of people. I already know, got a lot of hate comments on there, is Khmer's don't help other Khmer's. <laughs> Take that into consideration. Let me go ahead and repeat that one more time. Khmer's don't help other Khmer's. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give a moment of silence so all the haters can put the uh, hate messages and comments down there on the comment section while I give you this view. Okay. So... If you're not familiar with this place right here, I'm pretty much like in the Long Beach Signal Hill borderline. Like right across over there is Signal Hill. And I think this might be considered Signal Hill also. The reason why I wanna go ahead and tell you the location is because if you take the uh, 405, about 30 minutes towards San Diego, you're gonna go encounter a place they call Little Saigon which is probably the biggest concentration of Vietnamese Americans in America. So why am I putting up this narrative or, 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 or this location or whatever I'm telling you about Little Saigon and Vietnamese America when this is all about Cambodian issues, okay? Or Cambodian topic. <clears throat> well, I was gonna go ahead and, and uh, go to Cambodia town Long Beach and do some shooting, you know, with the, the camera. But if you guys don't know about Khmer Town, Long Beach, it's a very dangerous place to be. I don't think, I don't think I'll make it with this camera and somebody's gonna try to, to jack me for it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna risk my life trying to make a video in Khmer Town, Long Beach. I just go ahead and do it to a safer place like the park right here. And the reason why I picked up good old Little Saigon, Orange County, Westminster, California, is if you guys don't know the difference between Khmer Town, Long Beach, you know, drive around it, take a look at it, see what it is all about. There's one word to describe Khmer Town, Long Beach, and that's ghetto. If you don't know what ghetto is, it's a bad part of the neighborhood. So now, there's only a few K 
Cambodian shops that's that's open, you know, quite a, you know, not that much. Uh, it's a little bit spread out. And the reason why I pull and, you know, it could be COVID, it could be gentrification, it could be a lot of stuff, you know, whatever it is. But Khmer Town, Long Beach, is pretty much dying out. A lot of the Khmer's have moved, like, further away. Um, they only come once in a while to eat at the one or two, three or four restaurants that they have. Okay? So that's uh, Khmer Town, Long Beach that I want to go ahead and tell you about. Now, you take your car, you drive 30 minutes down to little Saigon and they have their own mall called the Asian Garden Mall and surrounded the mall I kid you not on one block you have about 10 full shop that's still running they're all operating um, you you walk on every single block and there's Vietnamese language, there's Vietnamese people eating cafe, you know, eating at the cafes, hanging out. This is a big Vietnamese community. And and one thing I learned about the Vietnamese culture is they are very family oriented. They are very community oriented. A lot of my Vietnamese friends are pharmacists, doctors, lawyers, you name it. See the Vietnamese, they have a strong family support unit, okay? And I think that's where the Khmer culture is different. Like I said, folks, I'm just going to tell you how it is because I've grown up in the Khmer community for 50 years and I've seen what the mentality is about. I've seen how the Vietnamese operate. I've seen how the Chinese operate. One hour away from where we stand right here is one of the biggest Chinese community in America. Everywhere you go, it's all Chinese signs. They help each other, they grow, they're very business minded. They don't, Chinese and Vietnamese do not say a word. They put in their hard uh, 12, 14, 15 hours a day at work. They shut up and just mind their own business. I, I see how that's how they do it, you know. But now let's go ahead and talk about our Khmer folks. The only time that Khmer will support each other is when you bring the Hennessy VSOP and the Remy Martin to the barbecue. They're drinking, they're partying, they're living the life like it's 1999, okay? The moment I asked one of the Khmer people, hey, I'm trying to support these uh, Khmer orphanage with books and supplies and things like that. Can you donate five, 10, $15 to help out a, uh, a poor Khmer kid? Nah, I, I, I don't have any money, you know? And that goes with a lot of people. It's like Khmer people, when it comes to Hennessy, barbecue, and drinking and have fun, it's cool. When it's about pulling up the, commu uh, the community, for some reason, they never have any money or time to, to help out. And uh, so let me go ahead and tell you this story. Um, like, whatever my opinion, so you guys can, you know, verify it. So I go back to Sukhumai a lot of time. And when I go there, I bring about maybe 10 iPhones, laptops, give to, you know, people for free. Family, friends, whatever that, so they can grow. So, I was on Facebook, and I saw this guy who was, uh, he had his video or his post or whatever like that about, he helps, see, I, I like the environmentalists, I like, the, you know, cleaning the world, cleaning the country, cleaning the streets. And so this guy, he's creating a school made out of trash. So the kids come, if they want to get an education, they get the trash, they recycle with him, or they, you know, they help clean up the area that they're at. They're like in the small little mountain village that the government doesn't really support sending kids to school over there. So I admire his work. 
And I'm pretty sure that, you know, when he started off, he was a small, he's small, he's, he's using his own money to support these kids, you know, to get a better education because I guess the government didn't re think that, you know, there was enough kids in that little small village to build a school uh, to help educate, uh, you know, the, the Khmer folks. So, you know, I, I read about his story and I, I messaged him, you know, what's going on and and this and that. And he's like, you know, he introduced himself. He's the founder of the Coconut School. And it's like basically like a trash school where, you know, like I said, the kids bring in trash to go to school to learn. And he's basically using his own money to build everything. And uh, I, I guess, like I said, he's trying to put on Facebook to get donations and whatever money from, you know, people in Sokmai to help uh, build his foundation. And I, I, I definitely knew that, you know, it, it was he was having a hard time collecting money to get people to help. OK, Sokmai, you have million dollar cars right in the streets. People are not poor. OK. Yeah, don't think that Cambodian has poor people. They have a lot of really, really rich people, okay? But don't expect any help from those rich people. And so when I mentioned him, I was like, I know what you're trying to do. I've been there, done that. But whatever you're going through right now, like how you're trying to get money from the Khmer folks in, in So Khmer, it's not going to work. I already... You know, I already know how the mentality is. Khmer people in So Khmer don't want to help each other. They want to actually step up. They want to be above that other person. So they don't look at you as like, you know, we're brothers and sisters. And, you know, we want to go ahead and help uplift everybody. No, it's like, I want you to stay low and I'll be higher. And when they help, it's not about like, oh, I'm going to give you this to help you out. It's like, it's like pity. You know, oh, you're so poor. Let me go ahead and give you this so you can survive and you can look up to me. So I told him the only way that you can go ahead and grow your school, your trash school, is you coming to America or you going to go ahead and target the Khmer Americans. That's going to be more helpful. And uh, what he said was, you know, it's pretty much like what everybody knows, like, I can't, I don't have the money to go to the U.S. Embassy to get rejected, to waste my time and all that stuff because there's a lot of people that have already applied that even have money that got rejected by the U.S. Embassy, okay? And I understand, I already knew exactly like what he's talking about because you don't want to waste so much time and energy trying to get a visa to come to the United States and get rejected. So I was definitely like, I already knew that was the case, but I had a, a trick up my sleeve because, like I said, I've been going back and forth to Cambodia 15, 16 times. I've been traveling the world and I had a few connections. So I had uh, one of my friends that he's a really good organizer for the Khmer community and um, he's very strong. They're in the East, they're like in the Midwest. And, the, you know, they have a tight Khmer community. So what I told the founder of the school was, hey, let me go ahead. I'm not going to promise you that I'm going to get you to America, okay? I'm going to go ahead and try to help you out because I like what you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and forward your information to my contact person in the Midwest of the USA that runs this great organization trying to promote Khmer culture and I'm gonna give him your information you guys could go ahead and chat it out and then we could go from there and that's all I could do I, I'm not gonna promise you that you're gonna be able to come because I already know how hard it is to come to the United States and so I left it at that two or three months later I get a message back from him he says you know ball guess what I got approved to come to the United States on a visa. And I was so happy for him. And uh, this was the start of the foundation of Coconut School, Phnom Penh.
once he got to America and he started opening the networks and we had a lot more people involved with the you know with the whole Cambodian American uh, community I think he got like 30 uh, laptops donated to his school he got money donated to it donated to him and so he went back to Cambodia with a stronger foundation now he has supporters from the United States from France and, and things like that so now his school got bigger and bigger and bigger because of the help of the Cambodian American community especially like I have to give props to uh, Kassol he's a he's a pretty pretty much the uh, president of the organization and uh, that's pretty much my story right there is like you know what the Vietnamese community they help each other I I saw it already the like the doctors in the United States in California whatever like that that's of Vietnamese origin they got a program that helps sponsor young Vietnamese students in Vietnam come to the USA to study okay and uh, like I said I mean this story is pretty much the, the mentality that a lot of the Khmer people that I know think when it's time for Hennessy, when it's time for clubbing and shaking the booty, oh man, I'm on. Call me in. When you're down on your luck and you need a few bucks, no one looked at you. So, like I was just telling you guys, this is all from experiences. Everybody's gonna be different, but we as a Khmer community need to take a look at ourselves and see what is important. Because there's like a hundred thousand Chinese from the mainland that cross into Mexico to the USA in about in about two or three years, okay? These people came here, they have this their connection in the United States. They come here, they got a house, they got a car, they got jobs, their community is tight. And I'm just trying to do the same thing for the Khmer community but the main thing like I'm trying to say is like we got to wake up and understand the faults that we have okay yeah and that's just that's what, like I said I mean I got faults everybody has fault but it's like hey let's go ahead and admit it let's try to build let's try to not name call and finger point and talk trash let's go ahead and see what is it that we can go ahead and do to try to resolve it trash on the streets pollution in, in Cambodia we know it's there let's let's go ahead and try to fix this uh, situation um, you know you got your my relatives that wants to study in the USA hey find a way to help you know sponsor them over here okay folks that's enough of my rambling right there I'm gonna go ahead and give you this tour of this lovely place and then I'm gonna call it a day <laughs>